Good Friday reminds us that we live in a world of pain. There is hope because we know that Sunday is coming, but there is pain and loss, regret and tears. This is where we live. This is what the world, what this world is. We don't want to move too quickly past this day because it is this day, this horrible, horrible day that allows us to say with confidence that this world is not our home. It is this day that allows us to say that even though it looks like we are defeated, we know that God will win. It is this day that we can call good because on this day, the God of the universe, who in human form died on a cross to lay down his life for us, on this day, Jesus the Christ took on sin, death, and the power of evil. So come, look, remember, and open up your heart as we worship together. We gather again on this Good Friday at the foot of the cross, which calls us on, not in shame or fear, but ever more deeply into the costly journey towards true life. There is wounding, and there is weeping. In Jesus the Christ, God is not separated from that. Let's pray. Holy God, on this dark day, we walk with you into the darkest places of our lives and our world. Bearing your cross, you lead us to discover that even in the darkest places, your love is ever present. And in leading us to carry pain and sorrow in life, we discover the healing found within pain and sorrow. So on this day, we see the betrayal of friendship and its consequences. 
On this day, we see that our enemies appear to have the upper hand. On this day, we see how unreliable your followers prove to be in a real crisis. On this day, we appear to see the death of God. As we gather at the foot of the cross, may we know your presence as we reflect upon this day and the effect it has on our lives. That while our suffering may seem great to us, it pales in the light of yours. Enable us to remember that the passage of events is not some distant history, but an experience of the religious bigotry, cruelty, and unreliability that continue in our world today. Grasping at your suffering, may we meet your willingness to walk on the boundaries of what is comfortable, that we might learn the lengths and depths of God's love. The betrayal reading is from John 18. He went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. (coughs) Then he stepped back and (coughs) fell to the ground. Oh, excuse me. They answered, Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said to them, I am he, They stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those you gave to me. When Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Betrayals lie like a stone of death within us, weighing down our lives with guilt or pain. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So another disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of these man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Humankind has not changed. We still give power to those who use it to oppress and destroy. We still fail to challenge those who allow the good, the innocent, the homeless, and the refugee to die. God in Christ, you travel with us towards the most wounded places in our souls. You know the agony of pain, guilt, and hurt deep within us as we face the fact that we have betrayed others or have been betrayed ourselves. Amen. Amen.
Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, he would not have handed, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? What is truth? (laughs) There's a question. What is truth? And truth was standing right there in front of him. Yet, what was a king doing bearing witness to the truth? What sort of kingdom could he have? In 2014, in Hangu, Pakistan, Aizaz Hassan, a 15-year-old student, was on his way to school. He wasn't particularly excited to be going. His classmates frequently made fun of him, bullied him because of his weight. On January 6th, he noticed a man dressed in similar attire to their school uniform, but Aizaz couldn't tell whether he could, could tell that he wasn't a student when he approached him and was asked for directions. Something was off. Aizaz noticed that the man's bulky clothing was hiding a suicide vest. The bomber, realizing his cover was blown, started walking hurriedly toward the gates of the school. Hassan took it upon himself to assure that he didn't make it. He began pelting him with rocks to try to stop him, and when that didn't work, he tackled the bomber, exploding the bomb. In February 1943, an Army transport ship, the Dorchester, with 900 men was en route to England. These fresh recruits were tended by four chaplains of different religions. Father John Washington, a Catholic, Reverend Clark Poling of the Reformed Church, Rabbi Alexander Good, and Reverend George Fox, who was Methodist. The ship was torpedoed by a German submarine about 100 miles off the coast of Greenland. In multiple accounts from the survivors, those four men calmed soldiers and led them to evacuation points. They tended the ones wounded from the explosion They donated their life jackets to those who had none. Rabbi Good even gave his gloves to one survivor to help against the winter cold. As the ship went down, these four chaplains, men of different faiths but believing in the same God, linked their arms and stood on the deck in prayer. Godwin Ajala was a migrant from Nigeria who worked various poorly paid jobs when he first arrived in the United States. At 33 years old, he did what he needed to to do so he could bring his family to the U.S. as well. He finally got a job as a security officer in in the New York World Trade Center, which he did from 6 to 2 every day, and then he studied late into the night for the New York State Bar Exam. 
On September 11th, instead of running to save himself, he helped evacuate thousands of people from his ground level security post inside the lobby, repeatedly returning to guide more people out of the blazing structure. Overcome by heat, exhaustion, and injury, he fell into a coma and died a few days later. During the Last Supper, John records these words of Jesus. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for another. This, this, this is God's kingdom, where we sacrifice for others, not just our friends and our family, but for those we don't know, for those who, except for our interventions, will suffer. As baptized believers, we are no longer citizens of this world, but citizens of the kingdom of God, called to be living examples of Jesus' self-sacrificial love here, now.
So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So that they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Lord Jesus Christ, wounded and crushed, you gave, gave your life, life that we might live. live. Condemned Christ, hanging in agony, Sharing the death of criminals, we pray for those who wait. Those who wait in pain, those who wait in anger, those who wait in sorrow, those who wait without hope. We pray for ourselves. Wanting an end to pain, anger, and sorrow, aching for a new hope. May your lingering spirit be the source of our life as we witness to you, sharing pain, anger, sorrow, and hope, however we can. Amen. There are a couple of ways of attaching a person to a cross. It depends on how long the authorities wanted the victim to suffer. Sometimes the victim was simply tied to the cross, and they died from starvation. If they were offered water to drink, they could, live up, they could live for weeks without dying. If the authorities wanted a quicker, more painful death, they would generally drive nails into the hand and feet of the victim. The nails were not driven into the palms of the hands, as most pictures show. Rather, they were driven through the wrist near the hands, if the spikes had been driven through the hands, the weight of the person would cause the nail to rip through the flesh, and the victim would fall. But when driven through the wrist, the carpal bones which attach the wrist to the hand keep the hands from ripping free. Even then, the crucified victim rarely died from blood loss. Most often they died from the inability to breathe. Before the nail was driven through the victim's feet, the legs were bent at the knee so that the bottom of one foot was flat against the vertical beam. One foot was then placed on top of the other and one long nail was driven through both feet. The weight of the body caused the victim to slump putting all of the weight on the nails through the wrists. This also caused compression of the lungs, which kept the victim from inhaling. As long as he was slumped down, he could not take a breath. To take a breath, the victim would have to stand up on the nail through his feet, causing excruciating pain in the feet but enabling him to take a breath. As long as he was putting all his weight on his feet, he could breathe. But 
when they became too painful, he would slump back down, cutting off his air. Eventually, the victim would become so weak that they could no longer lift themselves up on their feet to take a breath, and they would die. We will likely never know the pain of crucifixion. Most of us whine about the pain in our pocketbook. In the shadow of the cross, are we content to let the world go by knowing no pain or loss? Where will we take our stand? As Jesus sags down with the weight of his body on the nails through his wrists, excruciating, fiery pain shoots along the medial nerves and travels through the carpal tunnel along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. As the arms fatigue, great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps come the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, the pectoral muscles are paralyzed. The intercostal muscles are unable to act. He can draw air into the lungs, but it cannot be exhaled. Jesus would have to fight to raise himself in order to get one short breath. Carbon monoxide builds up in the lungs and the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself to exhale and bring in life, more, more life-giving oxygen. Doing so, however, comes at a price. To get a breath and to relieve the pain in his arms and chest, he pushes himself upward, placing his full weight on the nail through his feet. The searing agony transfers from his wrists to his feet, tearing through the nerves between the metal tarsal bones. 
Nevertheless, he gets a breath. He sags back down. It's undoubtedly during these periods of breathing that he uttered his short last sentences. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When air is so precious, each breath so painfully won, he still uses that breath to communicate forgiveness to the Roman soldiers throwing dice for his last pieces of clothes. Then he sags down again. The insurrectionist beside him pleads for his own salvation. And Jesus painfully raises himself to offer words of comfort and salvation. Today you will be with me in paradise. He slumps again. His eyes catch sight of his mother's stricken face buried in his friend John's shoulder. Drawing on the last of his strength, he consoles and sees to the care of his loved ones. Behold your mother, and looking at Mary, woman, behold your son. This time he all but falls back into the hanging position. The pain shoots up and down his arms. He begins to experience a deep, crushing pain in the chest as the pericardium slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump thick, heavy blood into the tissues, and the tortured lungs make a frantic effort to gasp in small gulps of air. The markedly dehydrated tissues send their flood of stimuli to the brain. He cries out a fragment of a psalm he learned as a boy as his mind reels from the lack of oxygen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This limitless pain, the cycles of twisting cramps, the intermittent partial asphyxiation eventually lead to a spiritual pain. As he sagged down one more time, he fought himself up, probably just high enough to breathe out the words, I thirst. His body is now in extremis. And he can feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. This realization brings out his sixth saying, possibly little more than a tortured whisper, it is finished. His mission of sacrificial love is complete. Finally, he can allow his body to die with one last Spasm of strength, he presses his torn feet against the nail, straightens his legs, looks into heaven and utters, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The loss of blood and the compression upon his heart due to lungs filled with fluid, Jesus died in about six hours. Since the crucifixion took place on the eve of the Passover Sabbath, and because it was against Jewish law for a crucified person to hang on a cross during a Sabbath, the Roman soldiers came around to break the legs of those being crucified. When the legs are broken, the crucified are off, unable to lift themselves up in order to breathe. And that would only, they would only be able to draw in air and not be able to exhale it. So it was only a matter of a few minutes before the victim would die of suffocation. So the legs of the two insurrectionists were broken. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead.
remember the death of our innocent selves. We remember the death of innocent, fragile things in the person of Jesus Christ for all eternity, no matter what they may cost. Let us cherish this body as did the first disciples. It is time to leave this place. Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In faith, we also commend ourselves into the hands of a loving God. After we receive this blessing, let us sing and then quietly leave this place together. Go in peace, embraced by the love of Christ. Walk today in the wisdom of God. Jesus does not mislead us. He who is the way will not guide us into blind alleys or desert wastes. He who is the truth does not mock us with deceit or lies. He who is the life will not betray us with delusions. May his wisdom sustain us who are weary. May his strength give courage to all who endure pain. May our faith bring light to a dark world so that together we will cry out for justice. Together we will act with mercy, kindness, and grace. Together we will live humbly in the inexhaustible love that lives beyond death. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth. Show us your resurrection world. Birth in us a new creation. Amen. <laughs>